In this part two of our exploration of the most interesting design ideas that defined the Boeing 727, I may have found the best two aeroplane hangar in the world. Well, at least the best for this fan of classic transports. It contains the last 727 ever built and her twin sister. Courtesy of the very kind and welcoming and super hardcore aviators who fly them, I get to observe this beauty in action as we enter the seventh decade of 727 operations. And not just any action, we go on a special training flight, and in the process, I'm aiming to learn how these absolute pros fly a tight formation of three JTADs 150 feet off the surface of the North Sea, and how they prepare for the various contingencies this venerable airliner designed in the 60s can throw at them when operating an aeroplane length away from the water. The year is 1984. The Space Shuttle Discovery has its maiden flight. Apple's first personal computer, the Macintosh, is launched, featuring all of 128 kilobytes of RAM. The games of the 23rd Olympiad are held in Los Angeles, boycotted in a tense Cold War atmosphere by the Soviet Union. Bruce Springsteen is at the top of the charts with Born in the USA. And, if I'm permitted the most tenuous segue of all time, this beauty is born in the USA in the same year, 1984. The last Boeing 727 ever built, the 1,832nd airframe to come off the line, the last of a batch of 15 200Fs built to fly freight for FedEx, bringing to an end 22 years of production in Renton. Nearly four decades of service and over 34,000 flight hours later, this last and probably best of the breed is still airworthy and in absolute mint condition, wearing the rather fetching livery of Oil Spare Response Limited. Registered GOSRA, it is operated along with its sister ship OSRB, another late ex FedEx 200F airframe by Northamptonshire based to Excel Aviation. They have a very special role as a rapid, this is how the Mark 0.87-ish 727 comes into play, emergency response facility in case of oil spills at sea. The aircraft is equipped with seven interconnected tanks that hold about two tons of oil dispersant liquid each. They feed a set of spraying nozzles mounted on a boom installed under the tail of the aircraft, protected by the tail skid. The boom is capable of a total spraying rate of about 1200 litres per minute of the liquid, which, when it meets the oil on the sea surface, breaks it down into small droplets, which sink and are then ingested by microbes. The goal is to prevent the oil from washing ashore. For a sufficient density of the spray to reach the surface, the aircraft must fly about 150 feet above the water at around 150 knots indicated. We will see shortly how this is done in an airliner that lends itself surprisingly well for this mission it was never meant for. And this is the incredibly satisfying result on an actual oil spill, a nice crisp swathe of cleared up ocean left behind by the 727. Of course, the liquid level in each tank has a significant weight and balance impact. So 2XL 727s are fitted with a dispersant quantity monitoring system. Each column of lights represents one tank and the number of lights illuminated indicates the fluid volume, roughly 20% per light. This display unit is used for loading and it has a duplicate on the flight engineer's panel who also has a digital flow rate indicator. As shown on the panel, on today's flight, the aftmost three tanks are in use, with the other four empty. This will have us departing with the center of gravity at about 30% mean aerodynamic chord position. This still means we are well inside the aft limit, which is 37% at our current weight, partly because much of the equipment is near the front, such as this compressed air tank, and we also have a slab of ballast at about where the first cargo pallet used to sit in the FedEx days of this aeroplane. As the objectives of today's flight are crew currency and equipment testing, instead of a dispersant we have fresh water in the tanks, 
which Captain Ian Cameron and his crew will be spraying out over a target area in the North Sea. And the North Sea isn't far. We are at Southend Airport to the east of London. It's a bit of a grey winter morning, 1200 foot cloud base and a few scattered showers, relatively light winds blowing straight down the Cat 1 ILS equipped runway 23. With our right pushed out onto a remote stand, a good opportunity presents itself here for a good look at Romeo Alpha. To the eye accustomed to earlier 7-2s, the most striking feature of this aeroplane is its midlife upgraded propulsion system. Of the original JTA D17A trio of 0.96 ratio turbofans, only number 2 was retained and hush kitted, with positions 1 and 3 being taken up by newer, larger fan diameter, 1.74 bypass ratio, quieter, more efficient, JTA D-200 series engines, perhaps best known for powering the McDonnell Douglas MD-80 family of aeroplanes. They are more powerful too, rated at approximately 21,000 pounds force of standard day sea level static takeoff thrust, as opposed to the 16,000 pound rating of the original 17A model, giving this aeroplane a total uninstalled thrust of 58,000 pounds or so if we assume that installation effects on the S-duct of the buried number 2 engine, I touched on this in part 1, shave a couple of thousand pounds off this number, then we arrive at a figure equivalent in contemporary currency to the total thrust of a pair of CFM Leap 1B27s, such as we might find under the wings of a 737 MAX 8. As we saw in part 1, the MAX-8 has roughly the same operating empty weight as the 727-200, and so, as it turns out, the same sea level standard aid thrust too. Much lower fuel burn and greater maximum payload, of course. The heterogeneous propulsion system gives the already quite quirky 727 a couple more interesting features, such as the slightly different middle engine gauges on the instrument panel, as well as the fact that there are three throttle levers, but only two reverse thrust levers. Only the JTAD-200 series outboard engines have these rather cool-looking clamshell type reverses, more on which later. Gulf Oscar Sierra Romeo Alpha, call sign Broadsword 27 today, is not only differentiated from most 727s by its upgraded outboard engines, but also by some modern avionics, such as Traffic Collision Avoidance System, ADSB, Weather Radar, whose returns are displayed on the screen behind the throttle quadrant, digital fuel gauges on the flight engineer's panel, and a flight management system, or FMS, with a control display unit similar to those on modern Boeings and to the MCDU familiar to Airbus pilots. And First Officer Matt Tones, joining Captain Ian Cameron at the pointy end of the aeroplane today, is just entering the flight plan into the FMS. Our aeroplane is probably among the last few dozens of civil aircraft ever built in the Western world with a flight engineer station. And today, the 2XL crew features Mr. Ted Morris in that role, looking after not just the normal systems of the aircraft, but also the dispersant system, making him quite a bit busier than the typical 727 flight engineer. OK, not quite this busy, as I'm speeding this up a bit to give you a sense that this is no Dreamliner or A350 in terms of bringing various systems online. You can see the oil pressure rising there as that has just started engine number 3. With all three engines running now and flight control checks complete, we are taxiing for departure from South End's runway 23 with a takeoff run available of 5,705 feet or 1,739 meters with a nicely inflated windsock. It is about now that it first strikes me how quiet it is up here. We are about 100 feet away from the exhausts of engines 1 and 3, and number 2 is further back still. Let me give you some weights at this point. The basic empty weight of the aircraft is about 44 tons, including the five of us on board. We are also joined by a task specialist from Oil Spare Response Limited in the second jump seat, 
We will be conducting an assessment of the spraying performance of the aircraft. The water payload, together with the dry weight of the dispersion system, is just under 15 tons and we are carrying a little under 16 tons of fuel. All this adds up to a total takeoff weight of 74.4 tons at the point of lining up on the runway, which is very handy because it coincides with the maximum landing weight of the aeroplane, meaning that in case of a post-decision speed emergency that we take into the air, we can return immediately and land without exceeding the landing weight limit. Not that losing weight is much of a problem for this aircraft, capable of ditching its payload, and the 727 also has a fuel dumping capability, with the corresponding controls guarded by this little door. The dump nozzles are near the wingtip, which is also home to a surge tank on each side, designed to accommodate the thermal expansion of the fuel and to an ACA inlet which pressurizes the fuel tanks slightly helping prevent the formation of vacuum in them as the fuel is used up. Back to our weight of 74.4 tons this combined with the relatively short takeoff run available does mean that the crew will be selecting flaps 20 for this departure as opposed to the more common flaps 15. For this flaps 20 takeoff, the speeds bugged on Romeo Alpha's airspeed indicator are 129 knots decision speed, 129 knots rotation speed, and an in case of engine failure pass V1 climb out speed V2 of 145 knots indicated. This is the orange bug. Another important datum is the wide bug at 80 knots. Up to this point, the crew will reject the takeoff for most cautions and other attention getters. Between 80 knots and V1, a rejected takeoff becomes more of an event, with an increased risk of an overrun, so the list of causes for stopping narrows to major system failures or emergencies, such as a fire. At this point, allow me to briefly take you out of the cockpit of Romeo Alpha and let's go back in time three decades and a bit to join Captain Alan Williams on board another 727. Alan got in touch with me after watching part one of this pair of videos on the 727 and after we had a tremendously interesting hour or so fly by unnoticed um, with, with him reminiscing about his long career in aviation, he'd flown all manner of interesting hardware before flying 727s for Dan Air. We got to talking about the systems of the 7-2 and how one might handle various complex system failures. And then, speaking of engine failures, he handed me this USB stick containing a video shot by a jump seat passenger of his in the early 90s. For the benefit of younger viewers, this is kind of a big deal. People didn't walk around with video cameras in their pockets in those days like we do now. So, interest peaked, I downloaded the video and had a look. And courtesy of Alan's frankness and generosity, so can you now. We are in Cairns, Australia, and this 727 wearing Dan Air's rather fetching livery is about to depart with Alan in command. And then this happens.
As you will have gathered, Alan and his crew realized early in the ground roll, fortunately well under 80 knots, that engine number two was not spooling up as expected, due, as it later transpired, to a broken blade. Quite impressive to see the quick, calm reactions of the crew. And with that, back to South End. Where, fortunately, we have no such dramas as we depart runway 23, flight engineer Ted carefully positioning the throttle levers to achieve a fan speed and one of 92% on each of the three engines for the ground roar and the initial climb out. The acceleration is quite brisk at a takeoff thrust to actual weight ratio of about 0.35 at this point. Captain Ian asks for flaps 15 first, then 5, 2, and clean shortly after, as we make our very low cruising altitude of 8,000 feet in a little over 5 minutes. We are cruising at Mark 0.41, just under 250 knots calibrated, which is the maximum certified speed of the spraying boom mounted on the tail. At this low altitude, fuel flows are relatively high, at about 3,200 pounds per hour per engine, which amounts to about 4.3 tons an hour in total. But there is no point in climbing higher, as it is soon time to begin our descent first to about a thousand feet as we approach the tasking area for today's exercise. And as we are descending through 5,000 feet with the thrust set to around 30% N1, the fuel flows are now way down. Incidentally, on missions that do not require the boom, such as long distance crews, it travels stowed internally to remove its performance impact and limitations. On a typical transport mission profile, we would have no business being down here, passing a thousand feet above an offshore wind farm in an aircraft not configured for landing, and the ground proximity warning system would let us know of this. But on Romeo Alpha, due to its special low-level mission, the spray system was designed so that the GPWS audio warnings are muted when the spray system is turned on. This means that the crew are not distracted in this critical stage of flight. However, to ensure that they are fully aware of the configuration of the aircraft, the visual warning lights are still active as they prepare to begin the final stage of the descent into the task area at 1000 feet per minute first, slowing to about 700 feet per minute halfway en route to 150 feet above the water, which is the target height for the first spraying pass we are about to begin. And this is a truly remarkable manoeuvre, sea skimming like a missile, except that we are in over 70 tonnes of classic trijet, at just over 150 knots indicated. The high lift system in the normal takeoff configuration, engines at about 60% N1 fan speed at this point, and the dispersant spraying system is active. Crew resource management is everything in these conditions, and 2XL's flows are very polished here. Ian, in the left-hand seat, has the controls, with his eyes mostly outside, 
taking regular short glances at the vertical speed indicator, looking to keep it at zero, of course. Matt's job at this point is to set the thrust required to maintain a safe speed, more on which presently, while flight engineer Ted monitors the spraying system and, most importantly, also has eyes on the radio altimeter, periodically calling out a height above the water. For any deviations greater than 10 feet from an orange radio altimeter bug placed at 150 feet, Ian must acknowledge the callout and confirm that he is making corrective control inputs. Ted is also keeping an eye on the engine instrumentation block and is looking out for any signs of a developing problem. So let us talk problems. In terms of a single engine failure, the critical engines are 1 and 3 by virtue of their greater thrust rating, but since they are very close to the center line, the resulting yawing moment would be minimal. This is an advantage of the 727 for this mission, compared to twins with underwing engines, which might have much more of a tendency to drop a wing and turn slightly into the dead engine. The more interesting cases are the double failures. Perhaps the more likely combination is 1 and 3 failing, because they are in the line of fire, so to speak, of one another's uncontained compressor or turbine failures. And this is the power critical event, as we would be left with the weaker center engine. The aircraft is, however, still capable of a positive rate of climb on engine number two alone, which is a nice bit of trivia to hang on to as we watch the waves rush by beneath us. From a systems point of view, the failure of one and two is a more interesting issue because the pumps of hydraulic system A are driven by engines 1 and 2. Presumably Boeing's thinking here was that this combination gave the best redundancy as those two are not alongside each other like 1 and 3 are. And while the main flying controls run off both systems A and B, the flaps only run off system A. There is however an electrical alternate flap extension system which, once turned on, allows the pilots to extend the inboard and outboard devices with these two switches. And this is what Matt would be doing at this point if we had a double engine failure. So why are the flaps important? The single engine climb performance is better on a clean wing than in the spraying configuration. So the first order of business in case of an engine failure is to set maximum thrust on the remaining engine and clean up. In particular, going from the rather draggy spraying setting of flaps 15 to flaps 5 is quite urgent. But, of course, this can only be done once the safe speed for each flap stage is achieved. This is a function of the stall speed for each stage, we saw these in part 1, so a particular stage can only be retracted once the stall speed for the next stage is exceeded. The spraying pass is flown above the V stall for flaps 5, so in case of an engine failure this low drag stage is immediately available, with the change to flaps 2 and then clean becoming available as the aircraft slowly accelerates in its shallow single engine climb. These flap retraction speeds are of course mass dependent and herewith lies an interesting challenge specific to 2XL's operations, namely that the mass of the aircraft will be changing significantly as the spraying progresses, potentially by over a ton a minute. The solution is a set of cards, one for each of a range of aircraft weights, which have these emergency flap retraction numbers pre-computed, and so the crew can just flick through these as the various spraying passes are completed and the current card sits on the panel in front of Matt, who will be in charge of following the most climb rate efficient flap retraction schedule on an emergency climb out. Fortunately, no such drama today as we have completed the spraying pass and 
After shutting off the spraying system and executing a gentle climbing turn to the left, we are now on the downwind leg of this tilted racetrack pattern. And here is something very interesting. We now get to admire the work of Captain Cameron and his crew because the fresh water they had just sprayed onto the surface during the upwind pass is still on the surface due to it being less dense than the salty seawater and it is a darker colour so even on a grey day like this it shows up quite clearly. With our supply of water exhausted in a couple of low passes above the North Sea, covering about 10 statute miles each time, we are back to our cruising altitude of 8,000 feet for the short hop back to home base. In the gaps between clusters of Stratocumulus, the county of Essex and its river Crouch catching a few rays of the pale winter afternoon sunshine. I am still pinching myself, incredulous that I actually got to experience this, not only flying on one of my favourite classic jets, but also having the privilege to observe the steam of aviators fly a challenging mission with complex contingencies and requiring some precise stick and rudder work, and somehow making it look easy in the process. We are on a Cat 1 ILS approach into the same runway 23 at London South End Airport that we departed from 96 minutes ago, though it felt more like 5 minutes to me. We did below the cloud base at about 1200 feet with the city of South End on sea visible in the distance, as well as some silvery reflections of the Thames estuary behind it. Matt has set flaps 30 for our landing can see the white lever by his left hand. Much like the glamorous Oscar Hotel we saw in part one, this aircraft also has the flaps 40 detent locked out, so 30 is the standard landing configuration. Our current weight of around 62 tons means a landing reference speed of 127 knots. It would have been 5 knots less on flaps 40. As we saw in part one, this difference narrows as the weight increases. Why is our VREF 127? This is simply a 30% margin added to the store speed for this weight and configuration, which we will call VS30, and that is 97 knots calibrated. We can also look at this via the lift coefficient margin above store. CR max for flaps 30 is 2.6, courtesy of the world's most complex triple slotted Fowler system. But we only need 1.5 at this speed. The CL ratio goes with the square of the speed ratio. We can also quantify the store margin on approach in this aircraft by observing that we are four stages of flap above store. This is what that 1.3 speed ratio means in practice. The moment we touch down, two amber lights above the engine 1 and 3 instrument column are illuminated, indicating that Ted has selected reverse thrust, deploying the clamshells on engines 1 and 3. Initially the reverses are selected to the reverse idle detent, and then, in this case, full reverse. The reverse thrust is then slowly reduced, aiming to be at reverse idle by the time we slow to 70 knots. We taxi back to the hangar where the two red and white jets are reunited once again. 40 years of service on the clock for both of them. Nearly three decades flying parcels for FedEx. 
Still going strong today, ready to be pressed into service at short notice should an oil spill occur anywhere around the globe. Sixty years, give or take a couple of weeks at the time of recording this, sixty years have passed since the 727 first entered passenger service with Eastern Airlines. The type is on the verge of extinction now and I feel extremely privileged to have been courtesy of 2XL and Oil Spill Response Limited granted my long-held dream of flying on one and a rather special one too, with last off the line Romeo Alpha and her red and white sister ship being the last two flying in Europe. A handful are still operating in the Americas and perhaps in Africa, but it won't be long before they are replaced by younger, quieter, less thirsty modern twins. And this is the likely fate ultimately of Romeo Alpha and Bravo as well. But by that time, the 727 will have served with great success for approaching three quarters of a century all over the world. Thank you, Mr. Jack Steiner and team.